Okay. Uh, my name's Josh Frazier. I'm the Vice President of Business Development with RightScale. So first off, thank you for being here. I like to point out a couple things because RightScale and the cloud in general, particularly in the early days, often got kind of pigeonholed as just for startups, just for small businesses, just for crazy Facebook games. Uh, we certainly do a lot of business there, uh, and we're very proud of that. Uh, these are massive, massive deployments. But I wanted to share with you just a few of the enterprise class companies that are currently using RightScale in the cloud for production deployments. And some of those logos uh, may be known. American Girl, you heard this morning. Um, so a lot is going on there, very interesting use case. But other companies like Mentor, that's a division of J&J &J and Quest, uh, you know, heavy in the, uh, in the medical uh, industry are using the cloud today. So there's a lot going on at the point. This is by no means just limited to uh, a startup audience. So wanted to make sure everyone was on the, on the same page there. I'm going to take you through uh, these areas. First, kind of the perspective of how to think about cloud if you're an enterprise customer. And this will be really how we sell to enterprises and how we engage with them. Um, and it's a pretty important approach that we take that works pretty well. So just give you a flavor of how that works. And then we'll jump into what we've seen. This is by no means an exhaustive list, obviously, but these are the four things we hear most often <laughs> when we're talking to enterprise class customers when it relates to cloud computing. So specifically, how do I deal with my existing certified builds and environments? Um, obviously, single sign-on and account management and permissioning procedures are very important, so how does that apply to the cloud? Uh, multi and hybrid clouds, there's a big theme at this show in general. So this is becoming a reality. Uh, very, very exciting for any large organization or service provider that has data center assets. You obviously want to utilize them. Uh, and then it's tough to talk to an enterprise company without security coming up. So we'll touch upon that. A side note on security, Steve Riley from Amazon is doing the breakout session on security. I think uh, not the next slot, but the slot after. So. If you want to go deep on security, um, I'm going to touch upon it here, but you'll hear it straight from the horse's mouth from, uh, from Steve. And he puts on a good show, too, so I encourage you to, encourage you to check his talk out. So how do we approach the enterprise? Um, this is how we phrase up cloud for them, and it tends to work pretty well, so feel free to steal this, uh, steal this approach and steal this slide, which is oftentimes when we, when we first engage with this company uh, that's an enterprise, it would be, I can't move that application because. You know, and so our response to them is, well, don't move that application. Because <laughs> the reality that, of the world that these companies are living in is they're not dealing with one single application, they're dealing with an entire portfolio. All right? And every company, large or small, has its own filtering requirements uh, on each application. So cost, security, price, performance, things of that nature. What the cloud is all about is it's not a replacement strategy. All right, we don't walk into organizations and say, hey, uproot what you're doing, shut down your database, it's, or data center, excuse me. This is about a way to complement and augment what you're already doing with your colos and your private data centers, specifically with three resource pools. Uh, the first one, public clouds, so obviously Amazon Web Services, Rackspace. Uh, private clouds, uh, whether they're uh, running at a managed hosting provider in that type of architecture or service provider, or they're running in your own data center. And then Amazon's virtual private cloud. This is the main area that we focus on. And what you uh, get as a result here is you have the ability where you can take an application, apply whatever filtering requirements are unique to that app, and put it in the resource pool that makes the most sense. Right? And when you can look at the world in this way, cloud suddenly seems like uh, a lot more logical, number one. Two, it helps get you over that hurdle of where to start. Uh, that's also a big issue we see with larger companies is not knowing you know, what goes first, how do I get some learnings here. Uh, and also, I think it emphasizes that you really have the best of both worlds. Because the reality is, despite us making a living uh, in cloud, it's not the answer for every app. And some apps are simply not going to move to any cloud resource pool anytime soon, and that's fine because there's plenty that can. So this is how we frame things up. And what I'm going to do here is take you through how we achieve this result and then show you in the dashboard the specific uh, configurations around the use cases and the approaches that you're going you're gonna to hear us talk about. Uh, how many people are familiar with server templates on RightScale? OK, so not that many. Um, what server templates are, this is our methodology. So this is how we approach cloud computing and architecting and managing servers in the cloud. Uh, as a quick side note, our, our founder and CTO, Torsten von Eichen, uh, he was the guy that ran 
uh, data center operations at Citrix Online. So half a dozen data centers all around the world, thousands and thousands of servers. He designed RightScale first and foremost with a user in mind. It was simply, what are all the things I never want to do again? <laughs> and he realized when Amazon launched DC2 in October of 2006, uh, RightScale launched a month later. So version 0 0.1 was actually uh, Torsten from a grant from Amazon uh, with some server time of $3,000. And he realized that dealing with the raw resources and bundling machine images was really, really time consuming and difficult, prone to error, and wasn't the right way to go about it. So he approached cloud computing with this server template mindset. And what this is, is it's basically ex abstracting as much as possible uh, away from the image. Uh, and housing it in what we call a server template that will dynamically configure that instance at boot time and do further runtime configuration uh, when that instance is, uh, is fired up based on remediation that you can set in the platform. The easy analogy that I use for, uh, for my wife, for example, is it's, it's like burning a CD in iTunes versus a playlist. It's not that burning a CD is hard to do necessarily, but to do it over and over again particularly when you want to make a change. Right? Dealing with a static resource like that is very, very challenging. Um, working with a server template is a playlist. You don't like song nine, drag it out, drag in a new one. The result is you don't have to bundle and maintain images. So RightScale does that for you, uh, or you can enable custom images with what we call RightLink. So this, this is the fundamental methodology and the approach that we take that's really the secret sauce behind the portability, the automation, and a lot of what makes RightScale RightScale, and a lot of why customers use our platform to access and manage cloud resources as opposed to going direct. You know, some of the highlights here, automation, um, and I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, but ask questions if you have any, please. Automation is around not only just launching servers, but configuring those servers in context, meaning bring them in, bringing them into a production system uh, that's addressing a specific workload. So if you're having a scaling event and you need to get more application servers, just launching application servers isn't enough. You need to bring those as part of a load balance rotation. They need to know what database they're going to write to. They need to have the appropriate keys to write to that database. All of that is done automatically using server templates. The alternative, of course, is you throw an army of sysadmins at it and they configure the instances uh, at the command line. Um, agility, this is a design once, deploy multiple places. Um, so thinking back to that chart on how enterprises view the cloud, if they had to approach in a different design methodology for every different resource pool, all right, it would become very, very difficult. With server templates, you're leveraging a single server template regardless of what resource pool you're accessing on right scale. And you're going to see that in the dashboard when we take you through that. Um, they become much easier to maintain. It's all component driven, just like that playlist, take out song, song nine, bring in a separate one. Uh, if you need to change something in a server template, you can change that input variable, that script, whatever it is. Uh, they're fully transparent and they're fully auditable. So you have access to, uh, to the code itself. You can make changes, you can write your own. Uh, so this is not platform as a service. You know, you can take a neat look underneath the hood and make any changes that you see fit. So let's get into a, a, few, a few use cases here. So you heard about a few of these this morning. Um, so American Girl, who here was here for uh, the American Girl doc? Okay. So you know this use case. Flash crowd, this happens to every company, large and small. You have a known promotion event leading up. You don't have any idea what the real load is going to be. So the ability to have an environment that will automatically remediate and scale is very, very common. So we've worked with companies like Mattel and American Girl, obviously. We've worked with Mars uh, Candy Corporation on a big promotion they did to give away free chocolate. Uh, and what happened there is people like free chocolate, <laughs> as it turns out, and the site was brought down. So they moved it over to the cloud and we automated it. The Sony use case, this was shared um, at one of the user groups that we had. Um, I think it was the last one. This is around rapid provisioning. So Sony manages and maintains artist sites for and the artist stores for most of their artists. So BobDylan.com, BritneySpears.com, MichaelJackson.com. Sony's actually Sony Music is actually producing and maintaining uh, those sites and those stores. Although the apps are very different, uh, the back-end architecture is very similar. So they need a couple things. They need an easy way to rapidly provision those environments. So New artist uh, signs on, they want to get a store out quickly, they're managing hundreds and hundreds of these. Things change, so they need a component-driven architecture where they can make a change to that architecture and then push it out. That's another way that they use RightScale. Michael Jackson dies, what happens to his website? It dies with him, so unless it's in the cloud and it can automate. 
Um, and then PCI is an interesting one. So because they are doing e-commerce, PCI 1 requirements became something they had to take very seriously. What we've done there is uh, actually set up a secure proxy and a payment gateway into the database tier, which is running uh, on-premise uh, in Sony's data centers. So they have the web front ends and the application tier running in the cloud and the database tier running uh, on site to adhere to PCI 1. Okay. So those are the consumer applications. And I want to jump now into the first demo and, and show you a few key concepts in RightScale uh, that are part of what we call the enterprise manager. And what you're going to see here is you're going to see a deployment, what that looks like within RightScale. Uh, and then I'm going to show you how you actually partition resources within the platform. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then get into some of the blocking and tackling around account management and user control. So basically some of what you'd expect in any sort of traditional data center management platform, but applied towards the cloud. So let's jump over now. And this is the dashboard view of uh, RightScale. So hopefully this is not, uh, not something new to, to most of you. You've at least logged into RightScale. Um, but what you see here is you see one deployment running, and then we have this default area. So I want to quickly just jump into this enterprise staging deployment and just show you what's going on here. A deployment within RightScale uh, is a multi-tier, multi-server environment. So uh, it's a collection of servers that are addressed towards a specific stack and configuration, uh, including networking components, storage, and automation procedures that are preset within RightScale. Uh, this one happens to be an IBM middleware stack. Okay, so this is WebSphere and, and DB2, and also a load balancer uh, running HA proxy uh, that's a combined with a uh, application web server. So this three server cluster is managed as a single deployment called enterprise staging. Okay, so that brings us to the first key component here for enterprises, which is you can manage environments, you can manage complete systems as one. And that's from both a remediation standpoint, so all the automation rules that you set within RightScale can apply at a deployment level. It's also at a cost and tracking standpoint. So you can see here, you actually get run rate uh, by hour, what this deployment is costing. So this looks like 25 and a half cents per hour. Okay. I can also bring and launch additional resources into this deployment uh, and deliver them, again, in what we call in context. Because they're being accessed and provisioned and configured by that server template, that server template knows it's a part of this cluster, and it knows not only to configure that server, but also to bring it in uh, to part of this enterprise staging deployment. Okay? So we're going to come back to this, um, but I wanted to just first show you the basic, uh, basic deployment, in this case, an IBM middleware stack. Next concept I want to talk about is, is resource pools. And particularly when you start getting into high architecture environments, DR use cases, hybrid clouds, you're dealing with basically this context of cloud resource pools. And that's how we think. So we don't think about a specific cloud provider at right scale. We think very much in resource pool context. Even within Amazon, for example, you have access to four resource pools, okay? East, West, Europe, and Singapore. Um, so what you can do within right scale is you can set up Think of them as virtual data centers or complete isolated environments around specific resource pools. So in this account here, Publish Master, if I jump over to the Clouds menu, you'll notice I have access to four different resource pools. These ones all happen to be provided from Amazon. However, if I jumped over to this account, uh, Hybrid Cloud C, and go over to Clouds, you'll notice I have access to four resource pools from Amazon and then a private cloud, okay? So at an account level, you can create isolation around resource pools. And you'll see how this ties in in a use case that I'll take you through uh, regarding a pharmaceutical company, Eli Lilly. But this becomes very, very important for compliance reasons, security reasons, cost optimization, all right? Same interface, multiple environments, dictate which resource pools you have access to. Any questions so far? Next, let's jump over and take a look at some of the account administration. I'm going to go back to this account, Publish Master, and go to Settings and Enterprise. And this is the Enterprise Manager feature within RightScale. And what this allows you to do is this allows you to associate multiple accounts underneath a single parent umbrella account. 
So in this particular case, this account published master, all right, it's responsible for all of the accounts that you see below. So development and Q&A, hybrid cloud, so on and so forth. In addition to that, you not only have all the permissionings around who you can invite, but you have real-time visibility into what's going on in each of these accounts. So if you're an IT administrator and you're extending environments out to individual users, project teams, and you need to do the appropriate tracking of cost consumption and extend access privileges, uh, you can do this all through the enterprise manager interface. The second thing I wanted to point out is that sharing groups. Do you guys see that, the second column over from the left? What sharing groups are is sharing groups are a way to take configurations all right, that you're setting as the IT admin in this case and publish those configurations out to the appropriate end user or organization that's going to access this account. So it's a critical feature that allows enterprises to build and certify environments and then lock them down and extend those environments uh, out to the end user or the end project team, whatever the case may be. I'm going to show you how those work here. All right, so that's the account management uh, function within the Enterprise Master. At a user level, that's uh, something wrong with the frame there, let's jump that. Jumping over to users now, you have the ability to set permissioning at an account level. Um, and this becomes important for a lot of typical use cases that we see, which is you'll have an individual user, which may be part of multiple projects or environments, but have different roles and responsibilities within each one. All right, so very, very important for the enterprise to set the appropriate access and permissioning schemes. So we'll pick on uh, Andrew here for a second. You can see Andrew uh, has various different rights within each of this account. That uh, looks like I'm refreshing. <laughs> Stop hitting that button. Looks like Andrew has various different rights in uh, each of those accounts. Um, you know, for example, in the development and QA, you know, he's an actor, so that means he can actually launch uh, servers and consume costs. But if you look at hybrid cloud E, for example, uh, all he can do is simply observe. All right, so we see this used quite a bit when you have single users that take on more than one role uh, on more than one team or more than one project. All right. The alternative, when you go user up, it becomes very, very granular and very complex. And oftentimes, you have a user going from environment to environment uh, and carrying permissions that you may not want them carrying there. Uh, sorry, your, your hand was up first, sir. There is, yep. There is? Yep. Is you? You, can set, you can set access to the right scale API, yep. So that user can only access the API, can't log in or do anything else? Correct, yep. And then for the observers, does this actually go to the OS level and create a login for them, or is this just for the, the interface? It's just for the interface, yep. It's just for the interface. And we are in this current sprint, uh, the first release of supporting single sign on is we'll be releasing support for OpenID. Uh, and then they'll be further, uh, further evolving from there. So there will be a multi-factor auth coming very soon as well. Yeah. That's a very popular enterprise request that we get. Any other questions on, on user permissioning? So are, they, are these system set roles or are these user defined? By the these are defined by the admin. So the beauty here is I'll, I'll give you a hypothetical. So say you're, say you're working with a, a development organization within your company and they're working on a project. Um, so you can create an environment within RightScale all right, which is a right scale account. You can set what cloud resource pool you want them to have access to. You would then invite those users with a certain set of permissioning uh, to that environment, that right scale account. And then when you're satisfied and they're done, you simply click on edit here. And let's say I want to now remove uh, Andrew from production. So I can just simply take out, so Andrew no longer can log into a server. I don't want him accessing anything in the library, but it's okay if he continues to observe that account. So I'm not moving anything here. I'm just taking Andrew, who is the developer, doing what work I needed him to, and now I'm restricting his ability to even run servers. He can go in and see what's going on, uh, but he can't start a server, he can't stop a server, he can't change a configuration. Yeah, I guess my question was, so an admin person has the ability to set up admin actor observer yes. on their own? Yes. Their own names are, their own names are. Well, this, they're all called the same, so they can decide whether it's a designer or a publisher or whatnot. These are the names that we set so far. So, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah to, support, to support custom ones is certainly fine. This just happens to be the ones that we set so far and what we call them, what we happen to sure, call sure, them. Sure. Yeah. 
So yeah, this actually shows the server login. Yep. So that is directly, you can SSH into the server. You can from the console, yep. Okay. Yep. Any other questions on this? Great. Okay, so let's, let's jump back now and just kind of summarize what we just saw. So here's what I just took you through in the dashboard. And it's this notion of creating multiple different environments. So there's a staging deployment. This one happens to be a you know, redundant load balancers, app servers, a master and slave database configuration. Um, I can have that isolated in one specific account. I can have specific users that are part of that environment. But then I can take this whole environment and share it with a completely separate right scale account and then invite additional different users with different permissions uh, in that new account that I've created. And I'm going to show you how you share in a second. But it's this bridging of configurations uh, in this very easy fashion, this publishing out and creating these isolations around resource pools and having specific users take on specific roles within each of these environments that makes this a very, very effective tool for enterprises that have this one to many in terms of the groups they need to serve as an IT department. So with that, I wanted to get into uh, the actual use case that captures a lot of this, and then there's, there's a couple more demos I'll take you through. Um, some of you may have seen this use case already. Anyone familiar with what Lily did? No, okay, that's good, one person. <laughs> so everyone knows Eli Lilly, I assume, the makers of pills that make you feel good? Good, excellent. So Lilly had this uh, crazy idea about a year ago, they wanted to create self-service IT. Okay, that's what they were calling it. So this was the bioinformatics uh, central IT group. They're servicing hundreds of scientists all around the world. They're constantly getting requests for environments. Okay, so they wanted to use the cloud and right scale as a way to create self-service access to multiple application stacks uh, and multiple IT resource pools. So that was their goal. Um, however, they had a bunch of requirements that were non-negotiable. Um, the first one, frankly, is any enterprise class organization. They had certified builds and compliant environments that they had to make sure were being used uh, in the cloud. So just because they were adopting the cloud or this was self-serve, they couldn't just deviate from what they had to do internally. So they had to ensure compliance. The second was they wanted to make sure that they were only giving access to the resource pools that were appropriate for the workloads that were being done. So if a scientist was working on a public data set, that's okay to move out to Amazon. Uh, if they were working on something proprietary, they needed a way to ensure that that workload stayed in-house. Um, next, they wanted to consume, or excuse me, track all the consumption and consuming that was going on and have real-time visibility into costs. Um, this is, a, depending on who you ask, a fairly unpopular feature, right? A lot of times it's better not to know what it's costing. <laughs> that start of the budget cycle, thumb in the wind, can be advantageous to some groups. So this gets you real-time visibility and allows the admins to go back and see that research scientist, you know, Joe Smith in Singapore, keeps running these jobs that are costing, you know, several thousand per day. And then finally, they wanted easy ways to share best practices. So they didn't want to have to go to this over and over again for every scientist that requested something. So the way we did, I want to first talk about how we address the configuration, uh, the compliance requirements within the configurations that they were putting forth. So here was the situation, you know, Lily, even if they were using a standard, you know, CentOS 5.4, for example, they had to build it themselves. They couldn't take a write image that we provided or made available on Amazon. Um, what we did was we launched what we call RightLink, and RightLink was a product of RightSkills that launched in March, I think, of this year. And it did two key things, and, and Lily was actually the catalyst to accelerating the commercial launch of this. We released it to them about nine months earlier. Um, it allowed you to RightScale enable any custom image that you were building. Okay, so if you had an AMI you had already built, uh, or you were building one internally, um, it would allow you to RightScale enable it. So essentially rebundle it with the right link agent and make it right scale aware. Uh, so again, assumes control back to the organization. The second thing it allowed them to do is we actually provided them our image builder tools that our R&D department at RightScale uses and we provided them to uh, Lilly. Um, so it allowed them to build these things from scratch. So the result here was that whether they had a custom image they had already done that was compliant or whether they were gonna build it from scratch, uh, they included right link through these tools, and it became right scale aware, but Lily maintained control. Okay, so that's how we did that, that particular piece. 
the end result here, um, what they launched, they called the IT vending machine. Uh, this is actually a slide from Lilly. So this is what they used to uh, sell and evangelize internally within their organization of what they had done. Uh, these obviously aren't the software stacks they're running. <laughs> Let's hope not, at least, the flash games. Uh, but it does capture the concept of what they did. They, they initially released four different environments. One was a chemistry toolkit. One was a collaboration stack, another one was a LAMP stack, and, and the fourth, I believe, was to run BLAST. I keep forgetting what the fourth was, to be honest with you. But, um, so they started with four, and what happened was the scientists could log into an environment, they'd get greeted with those configurations, and they'd have one option, start server. It would give them actually what they'd spent, uh, or if servers were running, what the current rate was. All right, so they called this the vending machine. And I want to show you how they publish these things out, uh, because this is exactly what the IT department at Lilly went through when they extend these environments uh, with this vending machine out to the respective scientists that were the end consumers. And specifically, we're going to access that IBM middleware stack that I showed you. And then we're going to take that and we're going to publish it out to another account. All right, so it's a running environment that we're going to take essentially a clone of and then publish it out to another account. And then I'll show you the end result, which is how someone accesses that environment as what we call a light user. And that would be uh, a Lilly scientist. So these are just the end consumers. They're not there to change any of the configuration. They're just going to run servers. So let's jump over now and let's go to back to the dashboard here in Publish Master. Um, so we're back at this uh, account, Publish Master, and this IBM middleware stack. Okay. So this is a running deployment. You see these nice, pretty green dots. It's been running for just under an hour. If I wanted to SSH in and get access to the, con uh, excuse me, to the command line, I can just click on this uh, console here. But what I want to do now is I'm going to jump over and let's take a look at the database. Okay. So I'm going to go into the database and, uh, oh, excuse me, I forgot the first step. <laughs> first step is I'm going to clone this environment. <coughs> I'm not going to make a change while it's running. So here's a running environment. First step is I'm going to take this enterprise staging deployment, and I'm going to click this button, clone. What happens with this is this is taking a carbon copy of uh, the entire configuration of this IBM middleware stack. So not just the instances themselves, but all the networking and storage configurations and the automation procedures, the replication on the database, the backups, everything that's in this running deployment, I'm just taking a snapshot of it and cloning it. I'm going to go ahead and rename this, and let's call this um, you know, production uh, underscore EMEA. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And you'll notice now it's not running. If I jump back and take a look at my deployments page, I now have that same running deployment. Here's enterprise staging. I've cloned it, and I now have this new deployment called enterprise staging uh, production EMEA. Not a very intuitive name, but let's jump back now and go into this deployment. And if I go to the database now, let's just take a simple example and say that I need to change uh, one of the input variables. In this particular case, I'm going to change the set of SSH keys. All right, so that's a right scale input. Again, these server templates are all component driven, so they're leveraging multiple scripts. Uh, we also support Puppet and Chef. And they're also leveraging multiple inputs. So if I go down to, in this particular case, um, let's go down to, well, the password or the secret access key. Okay. So if I wanted to go ahead and change my secret access key on here, I just go ahead and click Edit. And I've already defined this access key as an input. So I just simply go down, and I would change the necessary access key, and I can set that as a text entry or I can set that as uh, a, a credential that I've, in, I've set as an input and just select that appropriate key. I'm not going to do it here, but hopefully you get the idea. So you have an individual component that you can change. Once you've done that, let's jump back now and take a look at the deployment. Okay, I'm going to now publish this enterprise staging production EMEA deployment. So I'm going to go over to design macros and go down to new. And what a macro is is an automated way to build an environment. So I'm going to click deployment. I'm going to select which deployment I want to build it off of. So in this case, it's the one I just cloned. 
I'm going to go ahead and click Create. And what happens now that I've created this is I have the ability to publish this to the library. So you see this here, Publish to Library. It'll say, where do you want to publish? So this is the Lilly IT group, and they want to publish this out to another Lilly account. So I'm going to share it privately. I'm going to click Continue. Next, it's going to ask me, which group do I want to share it with? Well, I'm sending this out to our uh, European team. So I've created a private library, which we call an account or a sharing group within RightScale. And I'm going to publish this entire configuration into that private library called EMEA. I can add in any necessary descriptions that I want. So, you know, production, IBM, middleware, stack, long description. And then we can just put November 3rd. Okay? Go ahead and preview. And then as soon as I hit publish, this will now show up in the account that is a member of that account group. Okay? So Lilly IT Group Chemistry Toolkit creates the configuration, locks it down as an admin uh, in the form of a macro, and then publishes it out to research scientist uh, John Smith. So John Smith now goes over to the self-service account, and they would access the macros. So let's go to design. You'll notice here I don't have any of the information I had in the other account. So I'm set up as a light user. I don't have that enterprise or I don't have that account option. I can go to design, macros, view all. I don't have the opportunity to create one. And I can go down and click on this multi-tier IBM middleware stack. And you'll see here I have one option, which is run. So this looks very similar to what you just saw with the vending machine. When I click on run, I've preset within this environment a couple values. So let's just do the SSH key and then click run. And there also is an added twist here. Since I'm using a specific software that requires a license, I can even put in this environment an acceptance. You know, I can extend a EULA out that the user has to accept. And I'm going to go ahead and do this user meetup. Click OK. And what happens now is WriteScale will automatically rebuild the configuration of this IBM middleware stack deployment. This takes a few seconds. Go ahead and click OK. And if I jump back now and view the dashboard and go down to user meetup, delete me, you'll notice now I have this same IBM middleware stack that's been configured and is ready to run. So here's the end result. Okay, you just saw what Lily went through, uh, but I want to get to the punchline here because it's key for enterprises. Um, this is this is going to look pretty familiar to anyone that's configured uh, and provisioned servers before. So this is all the things that Lily had to do. Again, this was a slide they provided us, so we're very grateful for that. Um, the typical situation was after they got the request, so after the budget approval and everything was in line, they'd have to go through these common procedures to get that environment up and running. Um, what they do now is they simply click a button within WriteScale. Okay, they've already configured that environment through this cloning and publishing feature. They're simply clicking a button and getting the same environment built over and over again. Okay. So the net result, and this is, this is the best way we can think of to emphasize to enterprises what business agility is all about, is what you see here. What the 36,000 minutes represents, anyone have a guess? Not Brian? <laughs> 36,000 minutes, good. Setting up three servers and configuring them. 30, pretty close. So those doing math, it's five business weeks. That was the average time it took Lilly to configure an environment to a state where it was ready to accept work by the scientist, regardless of what they're setting up. So this was the average time it took them. They brought that down to 30 minutes in the cloud with right scale. So if you think about this for a second, right, people typically understand hardware to hardware. If they're really thinking about it, they understand allocation of you know, real estate charges, power, things of that nature. But business agility is hard to put your finger on what that means as far as a number. So if you think about how this changes business, okay, regardless of what business you're in, when you can take a process that you have to do over and over again and reduce it from 36,000 minutes to 30 minutes, this isn't about saving 20%. This is fundamentally changing the way you do things. 
Right? The result here is that IT is no longer a hurdle of any kind. Right? The time it takes to procure, the time it takes to configure, the time it takes to certify, all of that is reduced dramatically. Any questions on this? Last but not least, multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. And if you think back to the early requirements with Lilly, they wanted multiple resource pools. Um, so again, that isolation uh, that we set up within RightScale allows you to do that. And I'll finish the demo showing you that. But why is this important for enterprises? The reasons are probably pretty obvious to most of you. But these cloud resource pools, are they are where they are. So Amazon has a region where it has a region. There's very little I or you or any other company can do about that. You may need to run things for data privacy laws in other regions um, that Amazon may not have. So that plays, a, that plays a role. Compliance plays a role. Performance, latency issues, price. Um, also, you have kind of those obvious ones, which is if you have infrastructure that you've invested in, you want to get the most utilization out of it as possible. So this notion of cloud bursting uh, out to public resource pools uh, when you need excess capacity is something you hear quite often when people talk about hybrid clouds and multi-clouds. So the way we've architected RightScale, uh, and there's sessions on this later on this afternoon, is you have the ability to take what we've done with Amazon and essentially bring that management layer into your own data centers all right, using one of the enabling technologies that you see there. So the folks from cloud.com are at this show, so please talk to them if you're interested in uh, a private cloud. So you stand up your private cloud, and RightScale can now manage multiple resource pools. And what that looks like, just to give you an example of the cloud bursting scenario, if we jump back and look at user meetup demo, cloud burst, what you have here is you have an isolated environment, a right scale account called user meetup demo that has access to Amazon's resource pools and then two different why that button keeps doing that, two different private clouds, my cloud and then private cloud uh, in the West region. And what's set up here is we have, a, we have a load tester that's sending traffic that's running in Amazon. Okay, you see that US East is where that's running. Okay, and you have it bursting into a different, different resource pools that are running in the cloud, my cloud. Okay, so you can set the configurations here whether you're going in and out or out and in as far as public pools and private pools are concerned. All right, and we see this quite a bit, and the American Girl use case is, is spot on on this, which is they have infrastructure of their own, flash crowd phenomenon, they need the ability to burst out to excess capacity resource pools, they use the public cloud for that. So the ability to actually get access to additional resource pools when you need it is a very, very common hybrid cloud use case that we see enterprises uh, deploying with, uh, with right scale. Okay? So this is all made possible through that Hi, excuse me, through that server template configuration because it's the same configuration approach and the same server template that's being used to access and configure servers in Amazon as well as your private cloud.